happy Saturday, everybody. This week and next week on Saturday, we are going to be looking at some Hawaiian history. Today, it is Kamehameha the Great who united the Hawaiian Islands into one kingdom. And this episode originally came out in July of 2010. It features previous hosts, Katie and Sarah. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Katie Lambert. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. And Sarah was in the mood for a little hot weather history this week, so we decided to take on Hawaii. And today's subject is Kamehameha the Great. And I have to start with a little disclaimer. We had asked for some help with Hawaiian pronunciations, so listener Jody was kind enough to call me and give me her expertise. But any mistakes in this podcast are mine and not hers. Or mine. (laughs) So Kamehameha was born sometime around 1758, but he actually had a different name, and it was Pae, which meant hard-shelled crab. As a cancer, I can sympathize. But his birth carried an omen with it, and that's because there was this bright star shining in the sky right before he was born. And it may have actually been Halley's Comet, and that's how we put his birth year sometime around 1758, because that's when the comet was around. Um, But some seers said that it pretended a conqueror, and the baby was almost killed because as We know most rulers don't like to hear that there's a little baby being born who (laughs) might be the new king. Ask Herod. So it seemed like a good idea to get rid of him before anything happened. But he was snuck away and raised by another family and grows up. And he got his new name, Kamehameha, which means the lonely one. But eventually he was able to come out of hiding. He'd made it very clear that he wanted to be of service to the people who were in power, and the higher-ups recognized that. And there were other omens of his greatness, according to stories and not necessarily to history, uh, reminiscent of the sword and the stone. There is something called the Naha Stone, which weighs two and a half tons. And the story went that if you could move it, you would be the person to unite the islands. And supposedly, Kamehameha did. But in the meantime, we have a lot of other events going on. And Europe had finally discovered Hawaii in 1778 when Captain James Cook arrived. And he brought glass and metal and nails and buttons and muskets and cannons, which are two very importantly. important things. And in return, Hawaii had food like sweet potatoes and coconut and pork. And Kamehameha was actually one of the first people to board Cook's ship. And Cook mentions him in a journal. He's really impressed with this intelligent, observant, inquisitive young man. And this is a fairly peaceful introduction um, of Europeans to Hawaiians, but theft became a problem fairly early on. And after an incident of a stolen boat, Cook and some of his men tried to kidnap a chief for its ransom on February 14th, 1779. And they were killed with daggers that they had given to the people. And the Hawaiians took their weapons for their own. And these muskets changed warfare for the Hawaiians, and merchants aided and abetted the arms race because they could sell to one group and then they could sell to their enemies. And though those groups might kill each other, the merchants would be making a profit. Yeah, and Kamehameha is really one to realize the game-changing importance of these weapons. And his enemies realize it too, but it's it's – his key to ultimately unifying the islands. And he will ambush and steal and kidnap to get these weapons. Kamehameha wasn't destined to be king of anything, or at least that's not how people thought of him. When King Kalaniopuu died in 1782, Kamehameha, his nephew, wasn't the first in line to succeed. His cousin Kiwala'o was, with his cousin Keaua also taking some lands and some power. And instead, Kamehameha was the guardian of the family war god, which says something for how he was viewed. Of course, the war god is not just any god. But this is where the trouble really starts. There's a rebel chief who dies, and it was Kewala'o's responsibility to offer his body to the gods. But during the middle of the ceremony, Kamehameha stepped in and did it himself. And that was very shocking. And it either was a really bold move, like a bold power grab, or it was a major sign of disrespect. But we don't know his motives. We do know the result because from then on, it's him versus his two cousins. 
Keoua makes the first move against him, cutting down the coconut trees of Kamehameha, which was a big sign of disrespect, and Kamehameha has to fight back. So all other factions on the island pick sides, and there was a battle in 1782. Kiwalao was killed at this battle, and Kamehameha won over Keoua. But it wasn't over there. These fights would continue for nine years with Hawaii locked in civil war. And we have an interesting story that emerges that is a major part of the Kamehameha legend. In a strike against a rival, he kills women and children and innocent followers. And Kamehameha himself falls during this fight. And a fisherman hits him over the head with a paddle. And he doesn't die, but he takes away a lesson from it. And that's that you shouldn't attack peaceful people. And it ultimately leads to a law in 1797, the law of the splintered paddle, appropriately enough, which uh, gave a certain amount of protection to innocent civilians from their brutal overlords. But 1797 is skipping ahead a bit, so we're going to go back near the beginning of our Civil War. In 1790, a ship called the Fair American arrives in Hawaii, and unbeknownst to the people on it, one of the Hawaiian chiefs had had an altercation with the occupants of a different European ship and vowed revenge on the next one that came in, and Fair American, you are that unlucky one. Everyone on the ship was beaten to death after being thrown overboard except a man named Isaac Davis. But Davis wasn't alone on this rescue boat. There had been another white man captured, John Young, earlier from another ship. So there are two of them. And Kamehameha claims the rescue boat and the two men. And Davis and Young try to escape, but eventually they become his advisors and his interpreters. And they teach him about... Uh, muskets and cannons and foreign military strategy and pass on these lessons to his men, too. And this gives Kamehameha a huge leg up on the competition because if you're going to be fighting with European weapons, you need to understand not only how to use them, but understand European strategy. Kamehameha's next military engagement came courtesy of Kahikile, a rival who may have been his father. And he ruled Oahu, Maui, and Molokai, and he wasn't someone to mess with. He got Oahu in the first place by killing his foster son, torturing the chiefs, and then making a house frame of their bones. In in her outline, Katie actually (laughs) wrote a skeleton of a house. With, in parentheses, Ha ha, that gives you an idea of our process there. (laughs) So this guy supports Keoua, who is Kamehameha's enemy on the island of Hawaii. And Kamehameha reaches a decision. He can beat Keoua if he can just get rid of this possible father figure and the support that he's giving to his number one enemy. On his side, Kamehameha has cannons and muskets, well-trained men, and his own military genius. So his prospects are good. And in 1790, Kahikile leaves Maui to visit Oahu. Perfect. Perfect opportunity. Kamehameha invades Maui. And according to an article in Military History, and I'm going to quote, His strategy, better known in Hawaiian chronicles than in Western history books, predates the island-hopping campaigns employed by General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea and by Admiral Chester W. Nimitz in the Central Pacific by more than 150 years. So he's using very modern techniques, and ultimately he conquers. But there's one problem. While he was gone, Keoua started causing trouble back home on Hawaii. That's why you don't leave your island to go attack someone else's island. Oh, it's the lesson we learned. So they fight, and Keoua ends up giving up this round. But while he's headed home, a volcano erupts and kills a third of his men, which could not have been a good omen, but he remains obstinate in his quest for Hawaii. So it keeps going on and on for years, and you have to wonder how it's going to resolve itself. Kamehameha invites him to a meeting. You know, let's let's get the two rival factions together. So Keoua gets dressed up and brings his canoe and his men to meet him. But right after he arrives, he's blocked in the bay, and Kamehameha's men are on the beach with muskets and cannons. So Kamehameha asked Keoua to step forward to be greeted, 
And when he does, he's killed with a spear by an ally of Kamehameha's, and then his men are killed. So we don't know whether it was Kamehameha's idea or an independent action by his ally, uh, but civil war has now been quelled on the island of Hawaii, and Kamehameha has it all. So with the two original heirs dead, the two cousins, Kamehameha is finally in possession of Hawaii, but he has some unfinished business, and that's what we're going to get to next. So if you remember Kamehameha's defeat of Maui, which you should because it was about 30 seconds ago, Kahikile is not pleased, and he hatches a plan with the men of the island of Kauai to team up and strike against him. And Kahikile has cannons now, too, and his own white European military advisor. So perhaps he has a chance, and they engage in battle on the water. There are many deaths, but neither side won, which... You know, that's war for you. But European influence is growing on these battlefields. And the big example of this happens in about 1792 when the Englishman William Brown offers to trade military help, military assistance to Kahikile for the island of Oahu. So now Kamehameha's enemy has his own frigate. So he's starting, the scales are starting to tip a little here. If Kamehameha looked like he was on the top at first, it's not looking so great anymore. So he needs something similar to face his rival. And he allies himself with Captain George Vancouver, getting a ship in exchange for Hawaiian harbors. But Vancouver won't give him any guns and tries to get chiefs to reconcile, which is not the William Brown approach, as we will see. Then we have a twist. Kahikile dies in 1794, and now his sons take his place. Kalani Kupule has Oahu, and Kaeu Kulani has Kauai, Molokai, and Lanai. But the two brothers fight, as people tend to do over their inheritances, and Kaeu Kulani decides to go to war and attack his brother's island, Oahu. But Kalani Kapule gets wind of this plan and waits for his brother. And he has the advantage of brown ship backing him up with all that European weaponry. So he stays pretty nearby. And so Kae Ukulani loses. And he's actually killed in part because of Brown's cannons. And we learn another big lesson in this podcast, which is not to wear bright colors in battle, because when you do, it makes it a lot easier to hit you with a cannonball. Yeah, exactly. So Kalani Kapule is not very grateful, though, about Brown's Brown's help. help, all his great weaponry, his boat. And he kills Brown and puts his body on a pole, which is interesting because this is kind of contemporary to <laughs> French Revolution. French stuff Revolution going on. style. But um, next, he takes all of Brown's men and enlists them in his next cause, which is to attack Kamehameha. He's probably thinking he's on top of the world right now. He's just killed his brother, he's about to take over. No. No, he's not. It doesn't last long. The Englishmen take over the ship and throw him overboard and still ticked off. They make their way to Hawaii and hand over all of the weapons and ammunition to Kamehameha. So everyone's angry at Kalani Kupule. Who he's, isn't dead from getting tossed overboard. <laughs> Sarah <laughs> asked repeatedly during this, is he dead? Is he dead? No, he never is. This, this guy is like a zombie or something <laughs> in this podcast. He has no European support. He has no weapons. And Kamehameha, on the other hand, has all of these things along with two ships. So Kamehameha attacks in short order Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. But there is treachery afoot. His high chief, Kayana, is on the outs with the big guy. So he isn't invited to key meetings, which displeases him greatly. Uh, That's partly because he slept with Kamehameha's wife. So don't do that either. And he takes 1,500 of his men and meets up with Kalani Kupule. And this engagement is known as the Battle of Nu'uanu, and it happens in April 1795. And Kayana, who is, you know, he's been the high chief. Yeah, he's the number two. Yeah, he has all this military knowledge. He knows what he's doing. He's familiar with weaponry. He's familiar with how Kamehameha thinks and how he fights, the places he might attack, how he might do it. So he picks very strong positions. And for a while, it seems like his defense is unbreakable. But... 
he too makes the fatal mistake of wearing bright colors in war and a cannonball hits him too. And when he dies, everything completely falls apart. Kalani Kapule's men get their women and children to a safe place before they face off with Kamehameha's warriors, and they have no chance. They lose badly, and while some escape, most were driven off a 700-foot cliff. But Kalani Kapule does escape. Like I said, this guy does not (laughs) die. Supposedly, yeah, he goes off to live as a disgraced person in the mountains. So all that we have now for Kamehameha to win is Kauai, and that takes a a little while. There's a storm, there's a revolt, an epidemic, and so it takes until about 1810 before the chief of Kauai actually gives it over to him. But that's it then. The Hawaiian islands are unified, and he's king of them all. Some call him Hawaii's strongest ruler because he unified the islands, he managed to keep Hawaii's independence for quite a long time, and he made his rule an era of peace. And he was really a strong ruler, especially compared to some of the rulers who followed him. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in another podcast. But he stood up to European influence, actually used it to his advantage. I mean, that's what made him the strong ruler he was, but he didn't give way at all. No, he kept his islands wealthy with a monopoly on sandalwood and on port duties. And as far as his own rule, there were some harsh laws, but he also outlawed human sacrifice and let the islands have their own governors. And we can't forget the rest of his military legacy. According to one article we read, he assembled the largest mobile force of warriors ever organized, which is saying something. And he also developed some pretty cool military technologies like artillery on double canoes, which sounds awesome. And while we missed it this year, we're hoping to catch this next year. Kamehameha Day, June 11th, is a state holiday in Hawaii, so that is your chance to celebrate him. And as for the future of Hawaii's monarchy, you'll have to wait for our next installment. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 